Good evening and welcome to the Coral Springs Coral Springs Mayor's Town Hall meeting. I'm Lynn Martzel. I'm the Director of Marketing here at the city and I'm going to serve as your moderator this evening. Before I introduce our panelists, uh, let's kick off our town hall meeting with Mayor Scott Brook leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. Great. Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'm going to ask you to please remain standing and join me in our town hall in a moment of silence. I'd like to dedicate this moment of silence to Congressman John Lewis. He was a true civil rights pioneer. We were honored to have him visit our city back in 2010 when I was mayor at that time for our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. His life will continue to inspire many and his legacy will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, we come together as a community to discuss issues affecting our city. It's no secret that our nation is navigating through very trying times, and these are challenges that affect us all. In times like these, we realize the importance of unity in our community, from our residents to medical professionals, first responders, essential workers, and especially our dedicated staff. I wanna start by introducing today's panelists. First, we have Grace Carrington. She is a small business owner in the healthcare and insurance industry, who has been a Coral Springs resident since the late 90s. Grace, Grace serves as a, the state committee woman in Broward County and is the Broward County chapter founding member of nonpartisan 501c3 charitable organization, the National Congress of Black Women. In addition, Grace is an integral part of our city's volunteer programs. She serves as the fundraising chair for the Martin Luther Jr. Committee. Uh, which provides scholarships to high school students in financial need. Thank you, Grace, for joining us this evening. We also have Ahmed Avilia. He's the managing director of municipalities at Fiduciary Trust International. He's a committed servant and advocate for our community. Ahmed is a member of the City of Coral Springs Finance Oversight Committee, Martin Luther King Jr. Monument Committee, and board member for City of Coral Springs Youth Soccer. In addition, he sits on the board for the Broward Alliance for Neighborhood Development, a nonprofit organization that advocates for affordable housing and community economic development in Broward County, where he serves as their treasurer. Thank you for joining us, Ahmed. We also have Sean Kahn. He's a licensed mental health counselor who works closely with the city and its employees. With over 24 years of experience in the behavioral health field, Sean is a graduate from Nova Southeastern University. He has worked with Henderson Behavioral Health Mobile Crisis for more than 18 years, where he's gained much of his experience. Currently, he's in private practice in Fort Lauderdale, and for the past three years has been a member of the clinician response team for Coral Springs Parkland Fire Rescue. Thank you for joining us, Sean. Then we also have with us our medical director, Dr. Peter Antevi, a regular here on many of our Facebook Live sessions. He's a nationally recognized lecturer, expert in the field of pre-hospital pediatrics. Dr. Antevi received his medical degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine and his pediatric training at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Dr. Antevi has been a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital since 2005. He currently serves as the president of the Greater Broward EMS Medical Directors Association, an organization whose providers serve the nearly 2 million residents of Broward County. We appreciate you being with us today, Dr. Antevi. Thank you. And then lastly, of course, this is the mayor's town hall, and we have our mayor here with us, Mayor Scott Brook. Uh, he has served as a city commissioner from 2002 to 2006 and as our city's mayor from 2006 to 2010. He was sworn in as Coral Springs mayor in March 2019 after a special election was held to fill the vacancy after the passing of Mayor Skip Campbell. 
Mayor Brooke ran for mayor unopposed this year, and he'll serve our community for an additional two years. I ask that he share with you why he wanted to host tonight's town hall meeting. Mayor. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to our commission and city management for putting this together. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us from wherever you are in the comfort of your homes, your office, maybe in your car. Uh, this town hall serves as much more than just a conversation with you, our community. Uh, this historic town hall comes at a time when uh, many things are being faced by all of us, uh, including COVID-19, uh, many social issues, and it's time to bring forth more unity in the community and uh, listen uh, at another level. And that's one of the main reasons that I decided to put forth this idea uh, to the community. Uh, the turmoil that we are experiencing in our society has brought massive strains on the health and well being of many citizens. And for those of you that know me, you know how important mental health is. Uh, to me, I'm committed to mental wellness for all in our community. Um, and this month, while it's no longer Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, we're making it a special time for us to be focused on mental wellness here in the city of Coral Springs. It's the first time that we are faced in this globe by such a crisis. And together, we're learning the importance of resiliency, above all, mental strength, and above all, mental strength. Today's town hall is meant to discuss the social issues that are affecting our society, and more specifically, our city. Uh, we invite you to participate uh, through social media. We've invited you to participate through putting videos forth uh, before us. Uh, we have a couple of those. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your concerns. We want to hear your ideas. And we want to hear from our specialists who will provide insight, advice, and answers. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Mayor Brooke. May today serve as another moment for our city to discuss important issues with the intent, intent of finding solutions. Before we get started, I wanna discuss how the town hall will be moderated and how questions will be asked and addressed. We're accepting questions live from you, our residents and our business owners. And we also, as the mayor said, have pre-recorded submissions that we will be sharing with you throughout and providing answers to. In addition to our panel, we also have city staff joining us should questions pertaining to their area of expertise be asked. This includes our city manager, Frank Babinick, Emergency Management Director Alex Falcone, Deputy City Manager Robert Kernow, Deputy City Manager Melissa Heller, Budget and Strategy Director Catherine Givens, Police Chief Clyde Perry, and our Fire Chief Michael McNally. So we appreciate them joining us as well. So I'll be reading our resident questions and I will be asking our panelists to provide a response. I may call on more than one of you for a response. I do ask that our panelists keep their responses to under two minutes and same as our residents. Should we not get to your question or requires additional follow-up, city staff will be providing follow-up within the platform you're reaching out to us on. When you see me looking away from the camera, it's because I'm actually moderating the questions to my, my right. So with that, we're gonna go, get, go ahead and get started. I have our first question, which is for Sean Kahn. Um, there's so much pressure on people between societal issues, COVID-19 and isolation. What tips can you offer to help people cope during these times? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for the question. That's a very interesting question. Um, and we shouldn't underestimate the, the cognitive and emotional uh, load that all of those events can, can really bring. So a few things that we can, we can do is um, uh, recognize our own red flags when we're starting to have trouble concentrating or if there's excessive worry or constant sadness, um, you know, recognize it in yourself that you can, uh, you can implement some things to really try to minimize those, those symptoms. Um, one thing we can do is practice some good sleep hygiene and uh, try to get some rest and not just physically rest, but shutting your brain off. Um, and what happens in, in a, a lot of people's lives, especially during, during the COVID uh, isolation, um, we, 
we tend to mix our work schedule into our non-work schedule and we have to have a very clear routine with some of those things. So we have to create clear distinctions between your physical workspace, your headspace and and do things that we we enjoy. It may not be um, things we were able to do prior to COVID, but you have to find some things that uh, that we really like to do and, and do it for yourself and for your own well-being. Um, the other things we can do is practice compassion. Be compassionate to yourself and, and others. Um, and we can do all of, all of those things through uh, deep breathing, yoga, exercise, meditation, being mindful of where we are, who we're around, and, and how we react to things. Um, and, and we need to connect, connect with others, connect with family, friends. We need to connect with uh, members of our clergy, therapists. Uh, I think, you know, having a human connection really tends to lessen that isolation and uh, it can help uh, tremendously in the long run. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, Mayor, you created the Mental Health Network Alliance. Um, could you provide our viewers with some information about that organization, how it operates and, and what that mission is? Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, the acronym is MWNA. Uh, it stands for the Mental Wellness Networking Alliance. And we have three primary goals and that's along the lines of advocacy, education and treatment. Uh, our vision is living in a world where physical and mental wellness are equally um, vital. And our commitment is to help break the stigma that's often associated with the need for mental health, mental wellness. And we started it last March. Unfortunately, uh, we lost two teenagers to suicide as a result of the MSD tragedy. And uh, shortly after I got the text about Calvin Desir dying by suicide, I decided that I had to do something different for and with the community. As many of you know, I lost my dear mom to suicide when I was 23. And I wanna share uh, with the community about suicide awareness, engage in suicide prevention, uh, share, you know, uh, share love, share kindness, compassion, the benefits of therapy, uh, and also knowing that uh, nobody can ever take away the lessons for love, no matter how tragic a situation might be. Uh, and that's what I, you know, have retained with my mom. So we meet every month and we meet the first Wednesday of every month. Our next meeting is Wednesday, August 5th at 6 p.m. And anybody that wants more information can email me at sbrook at coralsprings.org. Uh, you can also text me at 954-494-9872. Um, we are now meeting, of course, virtually. Before COVID, we were meeting at Keller Williams, and there would be anywhere from 50 to 75 people meeting, talking about our, experience, our experiences, sharing solutions. We have anywhere from uh, eight to 15 therapists that usually join us. And we're really moving mountains to break the stigma associated with mental illness. Thank you, Mayor. I am going to turn it over now to a video that was provided by resident Gregory Lee. Could officers and or high ranking officials within the police department host town halls similar to this where citizens can ask them questions directly and or raise concerns? I think I'm going to turn that one over to uh, Chief Clyde Perry, if you don't mind addressing that and discussing um, some of the ways that you can connect with our police department. Yeah, good, good evening. Um, you know, look, well, that's a great question. And we're always happy when people reach out to us. Uh, ever since the George Floyd incident, a lot of people have reached out to us and have asked us uh, a variety of questions. We've never shied away from the ability to, you know, the opportunity to sit down and meet with people. In fact, I've had probably four or five in-person meetings uh, with just residents that had questions. Uh, one was a, a valedictorian from uh, Coral uh, Springs High School, uh, wrote me a nice letter, had a lot of questions to it. We asked him to please come in, sit down, talk with us. One was a resident that uh, had been here for 25 years that had some questions. We met with him last week. Uh, as far as a town hall meeting, uh, I'm not opposed to having a town hall meeting, uh, you know, Anytime that we can sit down and talk with each other, we find understanding. And anytime you find understanding, you find mutual ground and, and areas where you agree. More often than not, uh, you know, as 
as you may or not may or may not be aware, um, we've been meeting with some of the people on the panel here and some of the other uh, members of the community to discuss issues, you know, within the police department that uh, you know surrounding the George Floyd incident. And I think they've been fruitful. I think they've been good. In fact, uh, after the first one, it was funny. You know, all, all of the cops kind of got together and said, you know, I really didn't want this to end. We were, we were having such a good time, just you know, uh, sharing information and, and anytime you get to do that. So, you know, if, if that young man would like to make an appointment to come in and see me, I'd be happy to talk with him. Uh, if we would like to do a town hall meeting, I'd be happy to do that. I've never been shy uh, for talking and um, obviously uh, I don't mind doing it. So I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, speaking of that, you, you mentioned the meetings uh, recently, you uh, and members of the police department went, met with uh, community members for what was very successful meeting uh, meetings. Uh, Grace and Ahmed, our panelists, were part of that group. City Manager Babinick, uh, would you like to talk about when we'll be learning more about the outcomes of those meetings? Sure. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, so recently, as Chief Perry said, uh, we we had some meetings with uh, community members and members of staff uh, and, and uh, members of the police department, uh, chaired by Commissioner Josh Simmons. And um, within that meeting, we had two meetings. Within those meetings, we were able to discuss issues uh, surrounding our community and within our community. And as Chief Perry said, it was an opportunity to get a better understanding of each other's um, thoughts, each other's experiences, each other's backgrounds, and each other's expectations. Uh, so there was some great dialogue. Um, that took place and uh, Ahmed, Grace, thank you guys very much for being part of that process. We appreciate you giving up your time to uh, make Coral Springs, Broward County, the state of Florida and our nation a better place. You guys were, were tremendous and provided uh, just really, really great input that helped move this along. Um, from those two meetings, we were able to uh, publish a document and uh, within that document, there are are some uh, measurable outcomes, and there are some follow-ups that will be done. Uh, we will have further meetings uh, and interactions. Uh, the commission will uh, get an overview of what this uh, particular uh, document looks like tomorrow at a special commission meeting. The uh, committee that uh, was, was part, I'm sorry, the, uh, the um, task force that was part of this will also receive a copy of this. And I know Chief Perry's folks uh, were, were already starting to work on a lot of the things that were in there and have already made some progress. So we look forward to uh, sharing this document with the community and more importantly, we, we look forward to the outcomes that will, it will create. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, City Manager Babinick. Uh, Grace, it's you, you know, you were an integral part of those meetings. Um, you're, you're a very active committee member, um, an active member of our community. Um, you mentioned that you had family um, in police and fire uh, in New York, in the service in New York. Can you talk about what you think about the status of policing um, and your experiences here um, in the city of Coral Springs? Um, thank you for that question, Lynn. Uh, I think that because I come from an NYPD and FDNY family, I think I understand better than most what uh, the day-to-day -day looks like for those folks because they're near and dear to my heart. And um, my experience here in Coral Springs have been good, very communicative. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so active in the community. Um, when you have dialogue and when you have um, a relationship with those who serve the community, you tend to have a different experience and different understanding. Not to say that the professionalism that I believe uh, the staff of, of Chief Parry and um, uh, the, the fire chief um, are not that way to everyone, but I think it just makes for a, a closer um, relationship and communication and understanding of how we govern this great city. And it just makes it safe for not only those who live here, but those who come and work and play here because we have so many activities going on from, from one season to the next, notwithstanding COVID, of course, that we're all inside. And I think that what 
we could be is a mirror image for the other 30 cities in Broward County to be able to have that relationships, not only with their residents, but the people that visit the city. Thank you so much, Grace. And we are getting a lot of questions starting to come in, but I did wanna extend that to uh, Ahmed as well. In reading your bio, you're very involved, not only the financial side of our government, um, but also in our sports leagues. And I'd like to really ask you how you feel about you know the status of policing in our community and, and about what it is like to be a resident here in the city of Coral Springs. Absolutely, and, and thank you, Lynn, uh, for the question. And good evening to all that are watching and listening to us. Um, you know, as a resident of, of Coral Springs, and I think Grace just so eloquently stated, you know, the facts on, on how we view policing within the city of Coral Springs, but I can share my personal experience. One from uh, someone who grew up uh, in an environment uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, you know, dad was an engineer, mother was a paralegal, um, and, you know, in a community as, as uh, such a such a large community as New York City, and Grace mentioned she has family in NYPD, family in FDNY. Um, when you have friends, uh, in my in my case, friends that are that are part of that that family, uh, and you've been through and experienced sort of some disparities as it pertains to to policing, uh, where we've always considered policing more community policing, uh, and here in the city of Coral Springs, I personally have. Uh, experience what it is to community police. Um, I know I shared a story when we all met regarding my first interaction uh, with the police officer in the city of Coral Springs. And it was such a pleasant experience, uh, so much so that we were compelled uh, to write a letter uh, to the police department, sort of just sort of, you know, uh, I, I highlighting what the experience was in, in, in hopes that it'll be used as a guide or as a way to show and to you be used as an example of what, what policing uh, should be. So, you know, we, we live in a great city. Uh, we live in a city where our voices can be heard, our, our, our voices, uh, our concerns, and, and our ideas are taken into consideration. Uh, you know, it's a large but yet small city in that respect. And, you know, every day, you know, my wife and I have conversations about the societal issues that are taking place now and how fortunate we are to live in a city where we have the opportunity to have these dialogues to have these open lines of communication, because with communication, as Chief Perry mentioned, you have resolution. Uh, so with that, I think it's a way for us to come together and continue the dialogue. And those tough conversations will have to be had, but for you to have them is for you to make progress. And I think we're doing the right thing in this environment. Thank you so much, Ahmed, and, and I agree. I wanna let our panelists and city staff know a lot of the questions coming in are related to COVID. Uh, COVID-19, Robin Mark has, has been waiting patiently. So this one's gonna be for our favorite doctor, Dr. Antepi. Um, Robin asks, how how is our hospitals doing uh, during the COVID outbreak? Um, are our city's cases low? Is our hospital here in, in Coral Springs at capacity? And then he, he has a final question about, is there more we can be doing to help hospital workers at this time? That's a great question. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Mr. Mayor, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I think that this is a great question. The reason that we enforced the mask wearing, the reason that we had people stay at home early on was to so-called flatten the curve. And that flattening of the curve, in my opinion, relates to one thing, which is the hospital uh, impact that it's going to have in the county. Uh, currently in Broward County, we have about 11% capacity remaining. Um, and that is really for folks who need uh, intensive care, uh, ICU care. That will vary hospital by hospital. Some hospitals have larger ICU capacities and some have smaller ones. And the, the concern for me and for all of us has always been that if the capacity to ICU uh, exceeds what we're bringing them, then you end up having a situation where all of the residents of our great city are going to have an issue. And so um, the hospitals, as you know, have now ceased any elective procedures to open up more space. But the issue now becomes not just the space, but the people who are working on the front lines, our amazing nurses, all the doctors, really anyone who works in a hospital, all of our amazing pre-hospital uh, professionals, 
I mean, we, we need human bodies to actually help other people who are trying to survive. And so it's a space issue, it's a personnel issue. And um, I really encourage everybody to continue to you know, follow the guidelines, don't get yourself sick because the hospitals are, some are worse than others. And I'll stop there, Lynn, but thanks for the question. Thank you. And um, just as a follow up to that, uh, and, and I'll pass this along to um, our fire chief, Michael McNally. I know our fire department obviously works very closely with our hospital district. Um, and been doing a tremendous job, by the way, in our ALFs. Um, is there anything that our hospitals need at this time? Uh, people are asking about masks. Um, where are we at logistically? Um, and, and I know, obviously, Dr. Antevi, you provide a lot of response on, on capacity, but um, uh, Chief McNally, if you want to just kind of address that. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for you know allowing me to be part of this. Um, you know, we've been working really closely with our hospitals uh, to monitor those numbers uh, as we bring any patient in that is suspected of, of COVID-19 to make sure that we're providing the proper protection to prevent any type of uh, exposure or spread both in the hospital and also amongst our emergency workforce. Uh, we've been working extremely closely with all of our ALFs, our nursing homes, our group homes, our senior living community to make sure that they have the proper means necessary. And, and we've done so to be that conduit to help them with uh, obtaining those PPE items that uh, through the proper channels through the state and also through our logistics and that. Um, currently, I, I don't have the answer to what the hospitals need from us. I can reach out and, and get that answer, but I, I do know that uh, our members uh, have been prepared. We are taking the proper uh, procedures and, and measures to keep our, us safe so that way we can keep our community safe. And to follow up with uh, what Dr. Antevi said is, is please continue to, to wear the mask, continue to follow those guidelines and that so that we can prevent uh, further spread and to reduce the impact to our hospitals. Thank you so much, Chief. Again, we're getting a lot of questions coming in and, they, and they're kind of you know varied. Um, and I'm thankful we do have city staff here. Um, some are about closures. So we do have a question from uh, Justin and another resident. Justin was asking if we're scheduled for a shutdown on Monday and another resident asked, when are our playgrounds gonna reopen? Uh, we do have our emergency management director, Alex Falcone on the call. He can talk a little bit about how the emergency orders are rolled out and um, if we're expecting a shutdown and then also why our playgrounds are not open. Alex, do you mind taking that? Absolutely, thanks Lynn and, and thank you all for allowing me to be part of this uh, town hall tonight. Um, excellent question, a, a little bit about how those decisions are rolled out. Um, we're working in line with Broward County. So in terms of shutdowns, in terms of the curfew that was put in place and some of the restrictions on our businesses, we are following all the Broward County emergency orders. That's really to make things easy for our residents to follow. If you remember at the beginning of this, we had different regulations across uh, Broward, Miami, Dayton, Palm Beach, and collectively what all of our mayors across both the municipal level and the county level have attempted to do is get on a level playing field. So it's easy for all of us to follow the rules and do our part to stem the spread of this disease. Um, in terms of opening of our, of our playgrounds, that's something that uh, at this point I would say is undetermined. Um, we're going to make sure that we're doing everything possible to keep our youth safe and we're going to continue to take measures that we feel are effective and are backed by recommendations from the CDC and recommendations from our medical director, Dr. Antevi. Um, in terms of a shutdown this week, I'll say that we were on a call, uh, Mayor Brooke and I were on a call earlier this week on, uh, with all the county mayors discussing potential actions that we would take. The last thing that our mayors want to do is shut down uh, again, to harm our, our small businesses and, and to hurt our livelihoods. What I will say with that is that they've taken a very strong stance in terms of enforcement. Establishments that are not following the rules, uh, establishments that are not promoting social distancing uh, will be inspected and can be shut down. Um, so the new Broward County emergency order that was released a, a couple weeks ago actually provided for businesses to be closed for 24 and then up to 72 hours for subsequent violations. So those are some of the steps we're taking. The goal of all of us is to make sure that we're continuing to stay open, continuing to operate. Um, but with that said, if our numbers or our hospital capacities get to a critical juncture, our first and foremost uh, goal is to make sure that we're providing for the health and safety of all of our residents. And so uh, it's something that we certainly don't wanna do 
but it's something that uh, you know we're, we're keeping kind of uh, in, in the back pocket, if you will. So we're doing everything we can. Um, you can help avoid us, uh, help us avoid that shutdown by doing your part, uh, by wearing your mask, by staying socially distanced, and by following the rules, um, by, by not frequent, frequenting places where you can uh, catch this, by keeping up on good hygiene, um, and, and once again, by wearing that mask, you can help us prevent the spread of this, which will in turn help us stay open and get back to normal uh, sooner than you know than, than later. So thank you for that question, Lynn. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our next uh, video submission from Jonathan Leopoldo. Hi, my question is, can we use that land that was used for the Temple of Time for a new installation that's dedicated to the civil rights movement of 2020? I'm going to go ahead and turn that one over to our city manager, Frank Babinick, and then I have a follow up question for our mayor, Scott Brooke. So Len, um, as far as the uh, city hall property, the old city hall property goes, uh, we've been working with uh, several different developers on what the future of that property will uh, look like. Um, once we have uh, an idea of what's gonna happen with that property, it'll be brought to the commission for consideration at a future uh, meeting. But at, as of this point, uh, that property is being considered for development. Thank you very much. Uh, and Mayor, um, you attended a peaceful protest held by two students in our city. And why did you think that it was important for you to be in attendance? You know, uh, with the uh, brutal murder of George Floyd, there has been such angst, um, you know, throughout our society, uh, and rightly so. So these two young individuals uh, did a great job putting together a protest, uh, invited uh, the city, invited me and Commissioner Simmons to be a part of it. And I thought it was very important to show my support uh, against police brutality uh, for the protesters, for our community. Um, and beyond that, uh, really for unity. Uh, there's no place in our society, in our community uh, for making a judgment uh, based on the color of somebody's skin, uh, based on their religion, um, you know, based on any kind of prejudice that anybody might have. Uh, and what has uh, come about um, are, you know, there are some people that are making these judgments and costing people literally their lives. You know, I read um, um, in Malcolm Gladwell's, one of his books about Sandra Bland and what happened to her in Texas. and. I just couldn't believe it. And when I was invited to be a part of this peaceful protest, I couldn't say no. Uh, and let me tell you, they did such a great job and there are many people there. Everybody had a mask on. It was peaceful. There was no violence. Uh, way on the outside, there was a wonderful police, respectful presence. And uh, it was just a great example of the collaborative aspect of our community uh, to come together and move something forward uh, in a positive, healthy way. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to let our panelists know um, some of you have a lot of fans that are commenting, uh, just offering their support and thanking you for your participation in tonight's panel. Um, I did want to ask another question in from Kim Bailey, um, and, it, and it's related to mental health, and, and she does address it to city police and fire. Um, I, I am going to ask um, Sean to answer this one. You know, people do struggle with so many different things, and she was wondering, is there a way to host some type of seminar um, specifically for parent, uh, families dealing with um, family members who have dementia or Alzheimer's? That's uh, excellent question, Lynn. Um, there are agencies that do host seminars. Um, and one major agency in Broward County here is Broward 211. So if um, that individual would go to Broward 211, uh, their website, or call them um, at 954, I believe it's 537-0211, um, or 211 from a cell phone, uh, they would be able to give her information as to where seminars are being held, how they're being held right now, and what what's available in what community. Um, they have a, a very comprehensive bank of all kinds of meetings and groups and um, seminars being held throughout the county. 
Thank you very much. I well. also I have a lot of follow up questions really related to hospitalizations. Uh, people are asking Dr. Antetti uh, what the COVID numbers look like, what the age group looks like in the hospitals. And then also, if you could address what some of the primary issues are related to COVID-19 that require hospitalization. Sure. Um, the the numbers as far as COVID-19 are concerned, they're available on the Florida website. Uh, I'm going to, I'm actually going to pull it up because I knew somebody was going to ask this question. So I'm ready here uh, as far as Broward County. We're following these numbers every single day. Let's just talk about, first of all, the number, the, the median age of cases. Um, for the last couple of weeks, the median age has been in the, in the mid thirties. So uh, let's say between 36 and uh, up to the forties from as far as the hospitalizations go, that's a great question. Hospitalizations, the age group that's leading in Broward County for hospitalizations is the 55 to 64 year old. Um, and that's with 20%. The 65 to 74 year olds are 17%, followed by 75 to 84 year old, which are 15%. The deaths on the other hand, are a majority of those in the 75 and up group. So if we look at the age group of, let's say from zero up to 34 years of age, um, we've only had, let's say eight deaths, which is only 2% of the total population. This is Broward County specific numbers. And so, um, yes, there are many more cases now happening in the younger population. Yes, the hospitalizations are of the older, um, um, older population and the deaths are even, you know, again, in the, in the um, 75 and above uh, the majority of those cases. So I hope that answers the question, Lynn. It does, you're always very thorough. Thank you, Dr. Antevi. Carol is asking about how we as a city provide information in Creole and Spanish. Um, and and I, you know, as a communications director, do want to reassure her, we work very closely with the CDC. As a matter of fact, today, Department of Health provided us with more material to share with our community um, who do not all speak English. Um, thankfully, uh, we are ADA compliant here. And um, those who are watching, we, you know, we obviously make sure that our content is um, captioned, uh, which then can be translated as well. So that's, that's the answer there, Carol. Thank you for that. Um, we, we are getting a lot of comments, um, a lot of appreciation to the police department for their service. Um, I have another question about contact tracing, um, several questions about contact tracing here in Broward County. Um, sorry to ask you again, Alex, um, but can you talk about contact tracing and what department actually runs that for the county? Yeah, absolutely, Lynn. Um, contact tracing uh, is a very, very important part of the controlling the spread of a disease. And what contact tracing seeks to do is it looks at tracking down exactly who you made contact with. So if somebody tests positive for COVID-19, contact tracers are going through that person's recent past and figuring out which places they frequented, who they came in contact with, and who potentially could be exposed. This is important because we can identify individuals who are actively carrying the virus before they become symptomatic. So you can have asymptomatic spread. And the goal with uh, contact tracing is to stop folks from spreading it before they know they're sick. Um, contact tracing is something that's provided by uh, either the Department of Health or by medical professionals. It requires access to uh, sensitive medical information. And as such, it's best suited for the medical field or the Department of Health. Uh, Broward County has uh, supported the uh, Florida Department of Health's contact tracing efforts by using a portion of the CARES Act funding to hire additional contact tracers. So if you do test positive for COVID-19, you will be uh, you know, linked up with a contact tracer and they will help to identify folks who could potentially have uh, been exposed to the disease. Thank you, Lynn. That's an excellent question. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. We are getting a lot of positive comments um, and then a lot of comments, again, really related to the COVID crisis. Um, Dr. Antevi, um, there is a uh, report that there's a promising vaccine related to the virus um, in the works, and it might be in its final testing stage. Um, would this guarantee an eradication of this virus? Um, should residents be optimistic about this news? Lynn, 
If that if that question was for me, can you repeat it? I had a little bit of a glitch on the internet. No problem. Can you hear me now? So uh, we, we're getting a lot of reports that there's a promising vaccine in the works um, and it's close to the final testing stage. Uh, would a vaccine guarantee the eradication of this virus? Um, should our residents be optimistic about this news and how accurate are those reports? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the vaccine news is always very exciting to hear and uh, the early reports, you know, there's, uh, the, the vaccines are several of them are already in, in phase, three, phase three clinical trials. Um, so I think all of us are kind of happy about it, but I want to offer a word of caution to everyone that sometimes when, you, when you're thinking about that vaccine on the horizon, you tend to let down your guard. Getting a vaccine to work, number one, getting it out to everyone, having people understand that it's beneficial, um, that's going to take some time. So even if even if we had the vaccine in our hands today, it would take a while to get the people vaccinated and so forth. So um, I would say to everyone that a vaccine is not likely until the beginning or even, you know, let's say the first quarter or second quarter of next year, which means that we're, you know, let's say six to 10 months away. And I would say that let's, let's not use the vaccine news today to guide how we act tomorrow um, I would say let us stay focused on what we need to do today, irrespective of the vaccine. Um, so again, happy about the vaccine, yes, but I'm more hopeful for what our citizens can do, our residents can do today to prevent the spread of this disease like other countries have done. We're getting a lot of um, comments from residents who have uh, medical issues. Some have mentioned asthma, uh, others uh, just basically talking about the American with Disabilities Act. Um, I'm actually gonna turn this one over to our city manager, Frank Babinick, about mask wearing um, and in businesses um, that, you know, can, can a business refuse service if someone is not wearing a mask? So then, um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a good question. That's probably one of the most frequently asked questions we, we get. And currently, masks are required anywhere that uh, you're interacting with the public. Um, so there are exemptions for medical reasons. However, a private business can um, deny service to uh, anybody they want. Uh, they, they, they don't have to provide service. So uh, most businesses are, are very uh, amenable to those that, that are having uh, issues with masks. But at the end of the day, there is an order uh, that was put out by Broward County that requires masks in all public places and requires businesses to ensure their customers or clients are wearing masks at all times. And that is being strictly enforced right now uh, due to the numbers that are being seen in Broward County. For more information on that, you can go on Broward County's website. There's a, a frequently asked questions section with their, um, with all of the orders that are out and they have specific answers probably to your specific uh, uh, situation that you probably find a more in-depth answer for. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, City Manager Babinick. Um, also, I, you know, this is not related to societal issues, but we are getting a lot of comments right now about connectivity issues in the city of Coral Springs. We do get this comment a lot when we host our event like Slice of Springs. Um, the reason it's being mentioned and then uh, other people are, are asking about it is really about schools um, potentially then being online and having issues working from home. I know we've addressed this before, but I am gonna ask for um, our deputy city manager, uh, Bob Kernow, to explain who's responsible for the connectivity issues that we actually have here in the city of Coral Springs, um, meaning the provider. Bob, would you take that one, please? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and good evening, thank you for having me. So there are a couple of providers that are uh, servicing the city of Coral Springs. Uh, primarily, you have Blue Stream, uh, which is formerly Advanced Cable. You have AT&T and you have Comcast. So each of those providers have coverage in the city in various locations. And um, on the, well, each of their website, they have opportunities and offers 
uh, for folks who need to have internet access. There's also a web page that you can go to if you type in uh, where my address and available uh, uh, Wi-Fi capabilities or internet access capabilities where you can plug your address in and it'll tell you the best provider that's available. All of these resources and all of these links are made available on our city of Coral Springs main webpage. And that's uh, something that you can go to from a resource perspective. So when you go to coralsprings.org, uh, you'll see a resources section. And in there, you can click on each of the service providers to get information and contact information. And in addition to that, you can see the link that I just mentioned that talks about who is most prevalent in your area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to hop back over to um, a kind of a dual part question here. It's talking about mass uh, in incarceration, um, meaning uh, the spread of the virus um, to those who are incarcerated. Um, I, I do not believe we have this issue here. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Clyde Perry, Chief Perry address it, um, but wanted to know what the current impact of mass incarceration is on our community and are we mitigating that? Well, yeah, you know, I know that uh, Broward uh, Sheriff's Office, uh, Sheriff Tony uh, had, uh, you know, put out an order and something that we've been doing a long time is, you know, uh, rather than arrest somebody, you know, we've gone to a civil citation, especially with the COVID-19. Uh, we're trying to limit the amount of people in jail. Now, certainly, you know, in my opinion, there are some people who need to be locked up, people who are a threat to other people. Uh, who commit serious violent crimes and, and they need to be locked up. But across the nation, I think you're seeing a movement where uh, they're letting people out of jail, uh, you know, in, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. I know that the Broward Sheriff's Office uh, had put out a directive. We had already talked about it here. Obviously, we're trying to limit the amount of people that come into our building and, and come into contact. So. You know, if we can give somebody a civil citation and, and that will do the job, uh, that's how we choose to uh, respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent response, Chief. I appreciate that. Uh, Ahmed, you're, you're getting a lot of commentary here for your participation with soccer. Um, you know, I can say here in the city of Coral Springs, we get a lot of feedback from family members, um, you know, frustrated that we, you know, some active sports aren't playing and, you know, can you talk about what your decision is um, with regards to your family and, and what you're doing to keep your family safe? You obviously have a very active sports family, but their health is, is paramount. Absolutely. And thank, thank you for that question, Lynn. I think that's uh, top of mind for a lot of parents. Um, you know, no one knows what the future holds uh, as far as sports or just life as we know it from a societal uh, perspective. Uh, what we're doing is it's just trying to adhere to the policies of, you know, wearing the mask, uh, not, you know, preventing the spread uh, and preventing ourselves from being exposed. Uh, I have to say that I'm a little bit sad because I don't know if we're going to be normal when soccer season comes into play. And I have such a great time coaching uh, the kids. Uh, I see the, the the lights just bright up in their in their eyes when they're out in the soccer field. And it's an enjoyment that I get, that my family get, that my girls get. And I don't know if that's going to be the case this year. And I don't know what the alternative 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 is to playing outdoor soccer, right? There's really no other way. We can't do Zoom soccer. So it's going to be an interesting uh, approach to say the least as we move in uh, to that phase. But I also, you know, think that we're learning a lot from this, uh, from this entire experience, uh, good, bad, uh, where we're going to be able to sort of shape the future of how we do things as, as, as humans, is how we do things as society. And I really just hope that, you know, we, we sort of cherish these moments as we go through these pains stake in times and really understand one, how do we uh, make things better once we do go back to whatever the normalcy is. Uh, and as we sort of look at ways to make it more, uh, come up with in, in, uh, come up with, with, with ways to, to supplement what we know to be the normal, uh, hopefully we can figure out ways to make it better long-term. Uh, but as far as soccer in, in this season and, and anything that we know as outdoor sports, I don't think anyone really knows the answer on how to engage and how to resolve that. And I think only time will tell as this issue progresses, as it is the fluid situation. So we'll see. 
I appreciate that. You know, you said uh, shape the future, and I thought that was a pretty uh, powerful statement. Um, Grace, your involvement in city operations uh, from, from a committee member standpoint, um, can you talk a bit about why you, you feel it's important to be so involved in city government, to take the time to actually volunteer and do um, a town hall like this one, or participate in the scholarship uh, committee for the MLK Junior um, Awards each year? Well, I'll start with this, Lynn. Um, I used to be on those soccer fields and my husband used to be on those basketball fields with my girls as well. My oldest played basketball for which he coached. The middle and the youngest uh, played soccer for which I co-coached along with some others um, throughout their time in Coral Springs. I think that especially when you have children, you want to make sure you're involved as much as you can to your community. You know, I was raised in a community where um, every mother knew almost every child and vice versa. And I think that there's some value there. Um, after my kids aged out and, and didn't want to be involved with me, which you know is about 13 to 15, pretty much, you know, you start to figure out other ways that you can help other children in the community that are not yours. And I think some of the ways that we do that is participating with um, some of the committees in the city that that reach out and help. Um, the break spot, for example, is a good uh, example of that because over the summertime, we know all these things happen to maybe elementary school, maybe middle school kids as well. And I think my participation, our meds and, and our committee um, at the city, we do a lot to help contribute to making sure that those needs are covered for that period and also being involved with the children that come there to get those things. So I think those are some of the things that um, makes you feel a part of community while helping others. And I think that being on this particular uh, medium is something that we wanna share with the rest of the city. They may not be as aware of all the, the, the um, services that we provide and all the ways in which they can become involved as well. Thank you so much. And um, speaking about the summer break spot program, I think it's important. I'm going to ask Chief Perry if he doesn't mind just talking a little bit about um, what that program is and what it provides to students here in the city of Coral Springs and, and how it's run. Um, Chief, would you mind talking about that? I, I love talking about it. It's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I wish I could take 100% uh, credit for it, but I really can't. Uh, members of our staff uh, went out and they uh, Put together basically a summer camp uh, for underserved kids and you know it it just ballooned we have fantastic uh sponsors uh from businesses in and out of the city uh that all pull together uh we have police officers who volunteer their time uh, to do a, a wide variety of things whether it's art class with some of the kids whether it's reading to them uh whether it's tutoring them uh you know we we've uh doing sports activities with them. Uh, it, it just really is, if, if unfortunately COVID-19, we can't do it. You know, uh, the last time we ran it, we, we had over a hundred kids involved and, you know, we were able to uh, have a dentist come in and give them a dental checkup. Uh, somebody come in and give haircuts, eye exams. We found one uh, young lady that, you know, was struggling in school and we found that she simply had, she needed glasses. She had an eye problem, you know, so, uh, it, it is such a rewarding thing. At the end of it, you know, because of the, the uh, generosity of our sponsors, we're able to give backpacks filled with school supplies. Some of them are too heavy for the younger kids to carry home. So it really is something uh, that, that we're very proud of. Uh, we've received national recognition for the program, state recognition for the program. And, you know, I'm really sad that we're unable to do it this year. And I hope that we come back bigger and better uh, next year. Uh, hopefully when life returns back to normal. Thank you for that clarification, Chief. And, you know, to add to that, although Summer Break Spot couldn't run um, in its traditional format, I was really impressed to learn today that uh, the Coral Springs Museum of Art provided art classes to some of the Summer Break Spot students. And it's your unit, your community involvement unit, made sure that those students had the supplies they needed to participate in that program. So um, kudos, kudos to you and kudos to that staff who make sure that those, those uh, 
kids get the attention they need during the summer. Um, speaking of kids, and, and I'm gonna direct this to Sean, um, uh, Natalie had mentioned uh, about, you know, just this being a very difficult time, um, specifically for kids. Uh, school potentially not coming back in session, school certainly not being in session since March. Um, there's a lot of concern about children. Um, but to answer another question of Natalie, she you know talks about you know positive stories and and um, safety. And uh, we do have our safety town program running right now live that um, any parent can log on. Um, you can request the book and you can watch the videos. Um, talk about positivity. We really kept a program going for uh, over 30 years and it wasn't gonna be the first year that we didn't have it. So we went virtual. So, um, and as far as positive stories, um, you can only share so much if people want to provide you with that information if they recovered from COVID. But can you talk a little bit, Sean, about um, what this has, uh, the effect it's had on, on children in particular who are not socializing and, and what parents can look for and do to, to combat that? Excellent question, Lynn. Um, so some of the symptomology that, or, or mental health symptoms that are facing adults, Adults, children are also facing um, isolation, lack of social support, or lack of socializing, and and some of the things. Um, as a parent, as a parent myself, we have to sit down with our kids and and really discuss and and make those connections and talk to them and and determine what they're really worried about um, and let them express themselves. Have have them have an outlet for what they're feeling and what they're going through and really um, try to connect on their level. Uh, some kids will be more expressive than others and uh, we have to find a way of, of really implementing their expressiveness and how they can go about uh, dealing with some of the issues that they're facing. Um, if it's through art or through music, um, or obviously, you know, camps are closed and COVID has created just systematically so many difficulties for us, but um, going online and finding uh, creative things for their, um, for their time and, and really having them try to have a physical outlet as long as, as well as an emotional outlet. I don't know if that, that answers the question. Mayor, I think you wanted to add to that. I do, I do. So uh, I'm engaged with uh, many youth for many years here in Coral Springs. Um, besides having five kids, I've been doing a leadership program aside from my role as mayor since 2003. And uh, we are now planning our 38th uh, leadership program. We've helped mentor over 2000 kids, kids, and we do it virtually now. Uh, so the president is an incoming ninth grader to Coral Glades High School. This is her third program that she's the president of. Her name is Nicole Sanchez and her vice president is Gianna. And it's a great way to get both middle schoolers and high schoolers involved. And people can contact me about that. Uh, along with two other youth that are incredible in our community, Sanan Kasim and Brooke Bach, we've kicked off again the Youth Innovation Table. Uh, again, this is online. Yesterday, we had Representative Dan Daly talking about dealing with COVID, uh, and we took a lot of intelligent questions from the youth, and they networked with one another. Uh, from uh, uh, one of these extended office hours that I had, Neil Vogel, uh, the president of Heron Bay, suggested we do a mentoring program. So uh, PNA put forth a mentoring program, and we already have 25 mentors that have committed to virtual mentoring of uh, 25 mentees over the next six weeks, uh, all by Zoom. And uh, I'm utilizing uh, many interns uh, at my law office and through MWNA uh, to help kick off the mentoring program for 25 youth. So we're still looking for about 15 youth that would like to have mentors in the community. So those are a few options uh, that our young kids have. And a lot of it is because of the leadership of the youth in our community. They are, they're astounding. They're awesome. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, we have one final question. It, it was related to testing. I want to commend uh, city staff uh, for working so closely with not only the Department of Health, but also uh, the Florida Department of Emergency Management, um, making sure that our city has two test sites 
Um, but the concern is the turnaround times. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to our emergency management director, Alex Falcone, to address what some of those issues are. Again, a lot of appreciation online for the sites, but questioning why it's taking so long. Absolutely, Lynn. So um, first and foremost, our, our two testing sites are located. The first is at Mullins Hall um, in Mullins Park, and the second is a uh, Florida Division of Emergency Management pop-up site, which is located in the parking lot of Publix at Sample and Carl Ridge Drive. Both, both are very, very popular. We're testing about 1,000 people per day um, for COVID-19. So those sites were originally designed to test roughly 300 per day. I think just a testament to the staff at FDOH, FDEM, who's, who's worked on uh, you know, making sure we can expand capacity. The delay in test results is really the result of a couple of shortages, supply chain shortages at the laboratory level. So in order for us to process a PCR test, when the test goes to the lab, they need a sample prep kit and they need a reagent. What we found is that a couple of manufacturers uh, for these tests were running low, and that's just because there's a significant nationwide demand. Uh, additionally, in the last month, as we started to see this spike in COVID cases, that's corresponded with a significant increase in the demand of testing. So to put it in perspective, just on our small city scale, Mullins Park, we're testing roughly 100 folks per day throughout the month of May. Into the month of June, we've tested over 800 folks uh, per day on some days, but we're averaging six to 700 uh, per day. So we're seeing just in our municipality a 600 to 700% increase in the amount of people who want testing. That strained the supply chain at the laboratory levels, which resulted in the delayed results. Now, the good news is the tests that uh, have been recently given, we had a couple of folks that got tested on Friday and actually got the results back today. So we're back to seeing about a five day turnaround time, which for this mass public testing is really the goal, five to seven days at the max. I know we would all like to test in instantaneously, um, but unfortunately when we're testing that many people, there, there is a wait. So uh, I do encourage people, if you have been exposed or you are symptomatic to get a test, um, the Department of Health has worked to expand their lab capacity, which were, is resulting in shorter test times. So, uh, sorry for those folks that had to wait the, the extended amount of time in, in June. We're, we are working with Department of Health to get those wait times down. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Alex. Really appreciate that. And we're starting to wind down. I do want to let the mayor know that uh, Greg Lee said project leadership. Thank you for that, Mayor. Um, we have a lot of students who actually logged on and, and are commenting on that. Um, I am going to go ahead and close this up. And Mayor, um, I was hoping that you might give us some closing remarks um, before we officially end our town hall. I'd be happy to. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for being here, being present. I want to thank our panelists. You did a great job. Uh, you are integral parts of our community, and thank you for giving your time tonight. Lynn, uh, as usual, you're doing a great job with communication, marketing, uh, messaging, uh, and really keeping our community informed and connected. And, uh, you know, some things are a little bit tough, and we need to have some tough conversations and, and ask some tough questions. And together, we're going to, you know, get beyond this difficult time. A lot of times you may not feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but history is a great reminder. There always is, uh, and there will be a light at the end of this tunnel. We just don't know exactly when that is and exactly how it'll show up. Uh, but I do have a suggestion uh, in regards to us dealing with the uncertainty. Uh, when we first get married, uh, there's uncertainty. Uh, when we first have a child, there's uncertainty. Uh, but with both of those opportunities, uh, we look at most of that as an adventure. Uh, yes, an obligation, but also an adventure. And uh, what if we looked at this time where we are coming together as a community here in Coral Springs, uh, more of an adventure, uh, more of possibility, and maybe renewal. Um, and maybe that would help us uh, and help us help others as well. I also want to take this opportunity to remind you all about doing a census if you haven't done so already. Um, it really helps shape our community's future. The uh, website is my2020census.gov. 
and it only takes about 10 minutes to fill out the information. And to close, I just want to make sure that you're all doing your part to prevent the spread, encouraging others to do the same. Uh, we don't have to fight about it. There's no political statements to make. Just wear your mask, engage in social distancing, and continue to invite others to do the right thing. Let's be conscientious of our actions uh, and how they affect others. And most importantly, let's never take our health, our families, and our community for granted. Thank you for being a part of tonight, and it's been a great town hall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, I did want to mention Carol Smith uh, is talking about remember to uh, get your vote by mail. And yes. I promise tomorrow uh, we are hosting a special uh, meeting, commission meeting. Uh, it will be live on all of these platforms as well, uh, live stream, and um, people can tune in. And I will be providing a presentation on how we plan to market that to the community as well. The so website is BrowardSOE.org. BrowardSOE.org. Excellent. Uh, we do invite our uh, those who are participating in our town hall to also consider uh, joining us for Slice of Springs. Um, that is a community meeting where it is led by the department directors. You can ask questions about our operations, projects we have on the horizon, um, areas related to budget, public works, police, fire, um, you know, and, and code enforcement. Um, that'll be held August 31st right here on Facebook for those who are tuned in. Um, I remind our residents, stay up to date. Uh, you can continually visit our website, coralsprings.org, for very important information. We also push information out through a text messaging uh, application. You can text the uh, keyword Coral Springs. That's one word, Coral Springs, to 888-777. And every time we get a new order or something's changing, especially right now as we deal with this crisis, uh, we are using that text message option. So that's very, very important. Um, as always, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with any of your city officials, please call 954-344-5911. Again, thank you all for joining us for our town hall. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you to all of our city staff who made this possible. Have a great evening. And remember, Coral Springs, stay safe.